the end of an old era or the start of a new one for Stevenage. That's what we're going to be discussing today. It's very easy, isn't it, to write Stevenage off. I think a lot of people already have said um, it's going to be really difficult for, for the borough without Steve Evans as manager, somebody who kept them up in League Two in 21-22, took them up in 22-23 and achieved a ninth place to finish, including a sustained playoff push last season before moving on to Rotherham United. There's no doubt Borough will miss his managerial class and that of Paul Rayner. But uh, it's only two people that have left the club and uh, that replacing them is Alex Ravel, hoping to make a success of his job in the number one hot seat after being a prince to the king um, as a first team coach following his first stint as a number one, which was uh, which brought mixed results. Very interesting to see how Alex Ravel gets on. Has he got the minerals to make it in that number one job? And can Stevenage sustain a playoff push again this season in an increasingly strong League One? Well, that's what we're going to find out, hopefully, in this Summer Deep Dive. Yes, welcome along to the latest EFL Debate Summer Deep Dive. One of 72 we're doing across the EFL between mid-June and mid-July. Already the whole set of League Two uploaded to YouTube and Spotify. So go and check those out. Get yourself subscribed. Maybe even drop us a review once you're done with this one. But for now, I'm delighted to be joined by Matt Farley from the Stevenage Football Club podcast, live from Turkey. Oh, Gab. This seems to be a yearly occurrence. Once again, my man, look at that pie. Look at it. But yes, live from Turkey, my man. I uh, couldn't miss it. thought, you know what, I've got to be on. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm here, mate. I'm here. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for joining us uh, from your holiday as well, Matt. So, we really do appreciate that. Um, talk to us. Uh, you said off air that you're the most excited you've ever been for a, ste- for a season. I mean, I, I feel like you're always quite excited. So, so why is it this season especially? Do you know what? So um, I, I generally mean that when I say it, it's the most excited I've ever been for a season. I don't know why, but but I think the main thing is, is I think knowing that we're coming to a new era at the club. Do you know what I mean? Like we've had the Steve Evans era and you know, we knew that that wouldn't really last for a long time, maybe a few years at, at most. Mm-hmm. And we know that that's over and we've got, and we've got this new kind of clarity now. We've got this new era. It's the Alex Ravel era. It's back. But, yeah. it, but it's ready. And uh, I think that's why I'm really excited. And I think, I think to go along with that, it, it's, it's not just that. It's the league gap. You know, I never thought I'd ever see my Stevenage Football Club playing Birmingham, who is your <laughs> point of mind. But, but, but Birmingham and, and Huddersfield and yeah, Stockport, Wrexham. I mean, what a league. So um, I would say, look, I, I've been a Stevenage Football Club supporter for over 20 years, just, just about. It's definitely the most excited I've ever been for a season and do you know what I'm, I'm fully behind Revs and mm-hmm. look he's going to have doubters and I, I can understand why but mm-hmm. we're ready for this and I think we've shown that in our early recruitment so um, yeah look most excited I've been for a season. Mm. Yeah, you're uh, fully fully behind Revs. Um, I, I was actually at your, your birthday party a few weeks ago, and um, it's interesting. There was quite a range of views because, on the one hand, you're very pro, pro Revel and and very excited about what um, um, what what he can do, um, having shown great qualities as a coach. I've spoken to one or two who are maybe doubting whether Revs is um, is um, is the answer, and I, I know uh, Andrew Blair uh, is a bit more sort of on the agnostic bit more agnostic, I suppose, a bit more in the middle. Um, so does that reflect the feeling of the fan base, a little bit split, perhaps? Yeah, it's a good point. I think it is split. I, th- I, think, I think a lot of people think, uh, you know, Revs is ready. And I, mm. you see, the, the thing with Alex Ravel is he used this kind of example and analogy in his, in his press conference when he took the job. You know, it's like when you pass the driving test, right? And, and you learn how to drive, but you don't really learn how to drive until you get out and do it. And he had that experience. And, you know, he's had Steve as a tutor for two two years, three years, and he's ready. He knows where he went wrong and he's ready. And he's got to, you know, take that step and have that season to prove he's ready. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, what comes with that is that, you know, we're going into a period now where we're in kind of, I call it 50-50 land, if that's that's everything, where, 
where you'll have people who go, well, he didn't do it before, and that was a league mm -hmm. lower, so how is he going to do it in this division sure. the way it is? So, look, he's, he's going to have his doubters, and he's going to have to prove that, unfortunately, this season. But I, I believe he will with, mm -hmm. with the team we've got. But, no, I think it's fair to say it is split at the minute. When he was given the job, there was a lot of people that went, oh, really? Could, mm -hmm. could it have been an experienced manager like your mm -hmm. Michael Duffs or your Gareth Ainsworth that were available yeah. at the time? And I get that point. But look, it's all about continuity in football, and we've mm -hmm. kept that with Rebs and, and Scott Cuthbert, who I have to yeah. throw in there because mm -hmm. you know no one saw that coming. Neil Banfield, Scott Cuthbert. So, yeah, yeah. No, I, th I think it's a great point. Um, I think. Um, it, well, first of all, he's uh, like you, you use the analogy of learning to drive. Hopefully, he can rev up the engine now because. Oh, uh, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> you love um, that. Absolutely. Um, because um, I, I really like, I, I was actually quite impressed. I know it's a bit of a throwaway to be impressed with a press conference because you know, lots of managers want to come across well in their first press conference. But I did. it did seem like there was a nice dynamic already between Revs, Scott Cuthbert and Neil Banfield. I think um, Cuthbert and Revs can provide different um, different um, qualities, I guess, in terms of man management that I think will complement one, one another. Uh, and you can see they've already got a nice report. And then you go to Neil Banfield, who's got, who's worked at the top level of the game. And I think any young emerging coach needs that experienced head to turn to. Um, he's got Leo, Leon Hunter as director of football, but I think Neil Banfield's top, top level experience, I think he's going to make a massive difference. So as a dynamic, as a team, hopefully they can work together quite nicely. Yeah, I agree. I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think the balance, the, it's, it's the balance, isn't it? The balance of the management staff is perfect. You, you've got Revs who's obviously been there and done it, but obviously at the level that we're partaking in, it's new ground. But then you've got Neil Banfield, who, you know, a lot of people don't realise, he was Arsene Wenger's number one. But, you, you know, we're talking elite level football in terms of that, you know, image. Mm -hmm. And then when you look and you get Scott Cuthbert, OK, new to the coaching game, but has a lot of experience in the football mm. league level. So yeah. I think it's it's a really nice dynamic. And I think Alex Ravel made a point and he said, you know, one of the things that he learned from Steve Evans is when you go into management, you need people you trust. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a case of bringing in people because they've got good experiences. So, you know, what I like is Revs and Scotty have a very good relationship, play together at the club as well, which a lot of people forget. And then obviously Neil Banfield, I think Rev said that he did his coaching badges with Banfield and, mm -hmm. you know, was built on quite a good relationship. So, again, it's that, it's that continuity, isn't it? It's, it's, mm, yeah. I think the one thing that we've realised is keep the continuity um, and, uh, and build from there. And look, I know mm -hmm. a lot of people, again, are going to doubt us and I understand mm -hmm. that. But I'm fully behind this. And I, and I oddly, we, we've said for a long time, Alex Ravel is made for management. And it didn't work out in his first tenure. He was he was very inexperienced. Mm -hmm. He took the job because I think he felt he had to. Yeah. But now he's he, he's ready for it. And um, mm -hmm. he's got the team to be ready for it and the people alongside mm -hmm. him to be ready for the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think whilst there is possibly a loss in terms of the level of detail uh, that Steve Evans provides, um, especially in off the ball work um and 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 all you know being so tactically savvy i also yeah. think there's a trade off there where actually there's an argument or a school of thought that um steve evans didn't necessarily have the whole dressing room on side in the second half of the season um that maybe his man management style had um worked for for a large period and then at a certain point wasn't possibly working to the same extent um, and therefore you could argue that a different type of leader actually um, can could actually become beneficial at this stage and that if Steve Evans had stayed maybe things might have gone stale this season whereas with Alex Ravel you've got a leader with um, a, a different different angle on it um, obviously he has been a coach but he's now the big voice in the dressing room so um, I'm actually quite excited to see how he does and and possibly he can put a different spin on things. I completely agree. I, th I think Steve Evans, is, and, and this might be a really bold claim to make, I think Steve probably took us as far as he could take us. But I know it seems quite odd because people go, well, that's yeah, very, very far. So yeah, well. <laughs> yeah I, I think he, he, he got us to a level. You know, when when Steve was here, we were, we were contending for the playoffs. And I think that's probably as far as he could take us. And I'm not saying Alex Ravel could be the man to take us further. What I am saying is I think... Steve Evans' job was done here, if mm -hmm. that makes I think he, yeah. he took us from 
pretty much relegation to, to the National League to unbelievably play in the top end of League One. But I think mm-hmm. that was that was it. And although I, I think when you look at Revs, it's hard to say he's going to take us further. But I think what Alex Avell could offer is longevity in the role. Mm-hmm. And I think there could be an opportunity for the next, you know, three, four, five years mm-hmm. of Alex Ravel being a, a manager. And I think, actually, that was a step we needed to, to take as a club, oddly, with Steve leaving. So I think it's it worked out for us in, in that regard. But um, but again, to go, go back to the point, uh, you know, there, there's a shortage, isn't there, in, in young managers in football? And I, and I think Alex Ravel, there's a really good opportunity for him to be a, a, an excellent manager. Mm. And I'm really proud that hopefully, fingers crossed, Hudswood, um, that we could be the club that he starts that kind of catalyst and career mm. from. So I, I, look, I'm really behind him. I, I think the one thing that Revs has as well is the experience of being a footballer. The, the mm. fact that he's managed before, uh, the fact that he knows the club so well. You know, it's not like yeah. a job that he's come into for the first time. He's managed the club before. He knows sure. that he's worn the t-shirt. So I'm, um, I, I, I think he's going to be absolutely fine. And again, I said it to the guys uh, on the podcast many months ago. Well, two months ago. I don't actually think, and I, and I will stand by this point. I think with the players that we've kept. And, and, you know, the players that we're adding to, and obviously that's Alex Ravel's, you know, partaking job. But I, I don't necessarily think we need an amazing manager to, to do OK next season. So I, I don't think there's mm-hmm. massive pressure. You know, when you look in the squad... You think there's a lot there, of it... You've, you think you've got a lot of the base of what you need in terms of squad yeah. continuity, because there's been quite a low turnover from what you achieved last season. So there is an argument that you don't need to rip everything up. It's actually just kind of... go almost copy and paste what you did last season, I suppose. Yeah, I agree. And that's my point. I actually don't think we need a Michael Duff to do OK. Do you know, obviously, they're a very experienced fans. I don't think we need that. I just think these players just need a bit of continuity and, and they'll be fine and they'll stay up next season. So I think that was a big thing for me. But um, mm-hmm. I'm really behind him, Gab. I love him. I love the bloke. I just think he's just... He's, he's one of the nicest guys in football. And... I'm really rooting, and that's why I'm the most excited I've ever been for a season. I'm like, I've, look, Gab, Gab, I've got the season ticket, I've got the trading merch, I'm ready to go for that. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm backing Alex Ravel all the way. Absolutely. Um, so let's take a look at the squad that he inherits. Um, only one senior goalkeeper on the books, according to my notes, uh, and that's Tay Ashby Hammond. Um, do you think you'll um, yeah. recruit another goalkeeper and someone who might be first choice, someone to compete with Tay, or do you think you'll be looking at an understudy? Yeah, I, th- I think it'll be another competitive goalkeeper. I think, yeah, it, Tay's the only one. I know we've got Riley Mitchell, who's one of the younger youth kind of upcoming goalkeepers, but... I don't think Riley will feature much. Yeah, I, I think in terms of goalkeeper, we've got Tay, which is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd like to see a competitive goalkeeper to go along with Tay that can really push Tay for, for, mm-hmm. for that kind of number one, number yeah, one the, jersey. Yeah, the West Ham lad uh, started out OK last season, but then didn't quite find the form that he needed to really push Tay in the end. So, um, And then who do you bring out? Oh. McGillivray, I think you had on loan from... Um, yeah. Uh, so... Um, so yeah, hopefully another goalkeeper would uh, would make a difference. Do you think? Um, do you think you get a loan out Riley Mitchell? Possibly. I mean, it's a good shout. I mean, look, Riley's not going to really feature next season. Mm-hmm. I know that. I know that Revs in, he, in his in his past tenure when he was manager during COVID uh, involved a lot of the youth boys, but I don't think that'll be the case now. I think Revs knows that you know when you're in this league, you gotta you gotta. You bring in your youth, but you do it at a certain time. So sure. I, I think I think looking at it, Riley will probably be loaned and will probably bring in a competitive number mm-hmm. two to Tay. Yeah. I mean, that's what I want as well. Mm. How good do you think Tay Ashby Hammond can go? Do you think do you think he can have a a really big season this year and become one of the best goalkeepers in the league? Or do you yeah? You know, how do you feel about Tay Ashby Hammond? I think he can go up a league. Oh really? I, I'm, okay. I do. I do. I think Tay Ashby Hammond could play in the championship. I really do. And I think uh, one day um, there's going to be that inevitable position where I think a championship club will come come in for Tay. And I think it'll be a position one day, hopefully long down the line, but uh, I think there'll be, uh, uh, well, we'll be in a position one day where we probably sell Tay onto a championship club. I, th- I think, honestly, mm-hmm. um, I think, honestly, God, 
he's fantastic. He's so good. I mean, you know, this is a guy that, you know, he joined... He had very good credentials before he joined us at Boreham Wood, had a couple of good cut runs with Boreham Wood. Mm -hmm. I think they played Everton away at one one point and did really well. Um, he comes to us, he gets involved in the best bat line in a, in a division. He then comes up to League One and people go, you know, let's see how good he is. He's then involved in another best bat line in the division. And, and I, I, honestly, I think he's absolutely fantastic. And one of the one of the main qualities that he has as a goalkeeper is he makes things look easy. And that's very difficult when you play in goal because, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, goalkeeper is one of the most difficult positions on the pitch. And he makes it look easy. He makes saves and things look easy. And I think he's fantastic. A big part of our side. I hope we keep him for a good few years. But to answer your question, uh, I think Tay can go up a league. One million percent. Wow, OK. Big yeah, big vindication there. I'm sort of wondering about signing maybe a younger understudy to Tay, so who can kind of play a few games next season, but then possibly if Tay does get sold next summer, then you've got someone ready-made to kind of come into that four. Uh, that would be my sort of thinking, but very interesting to see what, um, what Leo Hunter goes with. Um, oh, now... I want to get on to um, the uh, outfield players, Matt. I want to ask you about formation uh, because at the moment I've sort of mapped the squad out as a 3-4-1-2 formation. But I think speaking to, to the guys um, a couple of weeks ago, it sounds like you think Revs might mix up the formations a bit next season. This is a really difficult one because, uh, look, we've, we've made three signings. Mm -hmm. In the outfield, uh, obviously, we, I'm sure we'll get onto them. We've got we've got Freestone, Dan Kemp, yes. oh Gabby, in, inject the positivity. What a signing, uh, Dan Kemp and Louis Appere, by the way, cracking little signing for us. Um, but I, I think it's really, really difficult this because uh, look, I've I've, I've um, written our squad down on, on a notepad, I'd be on my phone. And, and I've had a chat with the guys about this on the podcast. I am so unsure what we're going to play. Because when you look at the squad, um, you, you've got the defenders. And we, we've got a lot of defenders now with freestyle yeah. joining. And a so lot of them going well. Weenie, Nathan Thompson, Terence Van Kooten and Lewis Freestone, all of whom can play centre-back and all of whom you wouldn't be unhappy at all to see the, that all of them are, are good defenders at this level. So that would suggest to me that it's going to be a three at the back because otherwise um, yeah. otherwise you're going to have to keep, it's going to be harder to keep some of them happy. And yes, you can say some of them, you, you know, Freestone, you might be able to play left back in a four Terence Van Kooten, you know, Nathan Thompson. I, but yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think they would all see themselves as primarily as centre halves. So, well, this is the point as well. Is you know, what do we go? Do we go? Because look, we know Luther and Kane are going to contend for the right, the, the right spots. And, mm -hmm. and to be honest with you, by the way, I just want to say, either one of them. I mean, uh, Luther's Luther. We know how good and we know how you know much improved he's been. But Kane Smith has looked brilliant at League One. And if anything, I think. Kane Smith better for League One than he was League Two, so that I think that side's really well covered. I think Luther maybe has a little bit higher, a bit of a higher ceiling, possibly. Yeah, yeah, and I do agree with that. I think Luther probably does. Um, but when we look at the back, see, this is a really interesting debate because you know there's Dan Sweeney, who I love, who I think is a fantastic footballer, mm -hmm. Terence Van Kooten, Freestone, Carl Pigiani, and you think, well, you know, if we do go with that three, you know, who does he go with? Does he go with Dan Sweeney, Terence and Pidge, and Pidge is part of that left. Mm -hmm. Or does he look and go, actually, Freestone needs to play. So we go Dan Sweeney, Pidge in the middle, Freestone to the left. And does Terence Van Kooten get pushed into the midfield? So it, it's that's, all that's a bit... my like... reckoning, Matt. I, I'm not saying Dan Sweeney is um, um, a bad defender at this level by any means. I think, he, I think he can do a job. I personally would see Dan Sweeney as... Um, uh, how do I put this without saying? I, I I think there's four other centre backs that you've got that are better than Dan Sweeney. That's just my personal opinion. So I'm not sure Dan Sweeney gets into your best eleven, and that's not an insult to Dan Sweeney. That's just a, a, a credit to how good your your centre back options are. No, and I think that look, I think that's a fair point. I think when you come down to it, look, you know, let 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 let's say how it is. One of those players is going to be dropped. So I think I think it's a fair point because well, or two one, of them. yeah, well, or two. Something's got to give. I mean, look, if Alex, look, if Alex Lavelle turns around and goes, I want to play with a four, then it's a bit like, well, Carl Pizziani's going to be signed. So who's partnering Pizz? So he's going to have to drop a couple. So look, I I think it's don't get me wrong, Gab. 
it's a nice problem to have. It's a very nice problem to have. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have said maybe you could have the three and maybe three stone plays at left wing back, left back. But I'm not so no, sure. No, I, about I that. Don't, he played left wing, left centre back mainly at Cheltenham. Uh, yeah. And I think that's going to be his best role. Uh, for me, I think you need to recruit another specialist left wing back, unless you play with a back four, in which case you've got Freestone to compete with. But uh, I'd be more than happy with Freestone as a standalone left back because he doesn't have to sort of get forward as much. But um, So I think he can play left back or left centre back, which would allow you to flip formations. Um, but for me, if you're going to play wing backs, I think you need another option to Dan Butler. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And, and by the way, can I just say, I'm a really big lover of Freestone. I think he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I think, although he was at Cheltenham, very oddly, similar with Cole Pierciani at Oldham, with the sense where, you know, when you see a good player, but they're playing for a side that's struggling, yes. think, he would be a good player with a good side. And it's similar to Pidge in that regard. Yeah. So Freestone's got a lot of these qualities. But with us, he can really flourish and be a mm. real... So, do you know what? A lot of people are going to say Pidge is going to start. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. Obviously. But Freestone is a really good footballer. And I, I, I like mm. the way that he plays out from the back. I like the way that he wins his battles. Well, do you know what, Matt? Um, Freestone, I think, is uh, an obvious option for the left of a back three. So, if we if we assume for the moment that because Ravel's got five players who can play centre-back, it's going to be a back three rather than a back four. That would yeah. suggest Freestone has been signed as an option at left centre-back, which suggests to me that Carpegiani might get moved into the middle. Because Carpegiani is going to start because Pidge is Pidge, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's the debate. Does, does he move Pidge to the middle and, you know, play Terence or Dan Sweeney, right? Does he keep Pidge there and say, no, I want, I want that pace with Terence in the middle of the two? So... It, look, it, again, it's it's a fantastic problem to have. I'm really excited for pre-season because I think we're going to see a little bit of a mould of how Reds is going to play when, you know, the season comes around in August in League One. Uh, but look, it, it's a fantastic problem to have at the back. And look, you know, what made us really good last season? It was the back line again. We, we didn't necessarily score. I know Jamie Reid scored a lot of goals, but around Jamie Reid, we didn't score a sure. lot of goals. It was, it was the bat line again. So mm -hmm. I, I think really going into this season where, you know, people are saying it's one of the best league ones there's been in a long time. Yeah, definitely. You know, what, what the, what, what's our bread and butter, the bat line? Let, let's make sure that we're very strong and competitive at the back. And I think when you look at that bat line, and you, you know, we barely even mentioned Nathan Thompson, by the way. I mean, you know, mm. another credible player. When you look at that bat line, you, you would put your money on that bat line to be absolutely fine. So I, I think it's very nice and comforting going into this, you know, enormous division that we're going into, that we've got players that there. And, and to be honest with you, I think, again, whether we get a cover left back for Dan Butler or not, the bat line's pretty much done, if, if, if all of them say. So, um, very, very confident on the players we've got back there. Yeah. Who would you? Who would your starting back three then be? Oh, God. Someone's got to go all Paxman on you, Matt. I mean, Gab, it's... <laughs> you might get an easy ride on the podcast, but you're not going to get yeah. an easy ride here. Gab, it's 38 degrees here in Kusadassian. You've made me sweat even more now. I mean, hang on, let me just get the towel. Hang on. Just, just, just give myself a bit of a... By the way, how good does it look on the balcony? I had to go on there, by the way. Look at that. Look at that. Taking so, Stevenage Global. Oh, can I just say, everyone knows about that football club this week. Even the entertainment team are going to be season ticket holders. Look at them. Um, but no, uh, whoa, back three. I think for me... Um, oh, that's a tough question. No, I'm going to answer it. I, I, I think back three, the, the wing backs obviously probably make their mind up on their own. I think for me, going next season, I would keep to start Sweeney, Terence, Pidge. To start. However, I think Freestone could become a starter in that three and things could be shifted. But I think to start League One... I would keep with the three that made us so good, so great, and I would okay. keep Sweeney, Terence, and Pitch. But I really like Freestone. Okay, well, well, we'll have to wait and see how that unfolds. One to watch in pre season, then, I think. Um, talk to me about um, that. You, you, we mentioned how um, the sort of Wilden and Smith competition at right wing back. So, uh, yeah, just talk to me about those two. 
Wow, fantastic. I mean, again, I think I said it to you earlier. Lou, you know, Luther's like the player that you would probably pick every week there. But Kane Smith has been a bit of a bit of a not surprising one because we knew Kane's ability. But we thought, you know, that Kane would be better at League One than he was League Two. And that's obviously shown back in the last season he played a lot of games and were brilliant. Um, and I, I think there's going to be real competition there. I, I think Kane Smith's going to be looking at this season going, you know, this is the season I want to play a lot more than I've been playing. Mm -hmm. uh, Revs as well, change of manager, change of coaches. You know, if I can impress in pre-season and, you know, have a really good start, maybe Revs or, you know, look at me and go, actually, should Kane be playing? So, look, again, to go with the, the, the back line that we've said, it's a really nice issue to have because... Both of those two are going to compete for that place. And again, I think I think if you're a, I think if you're a betting man, you're probably saying Luther's probably going to start because Luther's been the I don't want to say spearhead of mm -hmm. that side, but he's been the player that started and competed the most. But Kane Smith in League One, I I, I like the way that he's got the ability to to get forward and show quality going forward. Mm -hmm. But then his flair coming back is is well matched. I think I think there's really good competition there. And again, I think pre-season for those two players is really important because I think mm -hmm. there's there's an open space there for any one of them to start playing League One, you know, in this upcoming season. Mm. Do you think if we're looking at opportunities for Stevenage to get better next season, which I think we've got to because the league's getting better, do you think that um, you'd like to see Wilding or Kane Smith? increase their productivity, especially if they're playing at right wing back in terms of attacking productivity, because uh, I think Luther Wilding's got uh, two assists last season. I'm not sure whether you feel like he could have had more than that um, in terms of chances created, but um, no, Luther Wilding had one assist. Uh, I'm not sure uh, Kane Smith had any assists. So um, is that something to, to work on in terms of maybe getting into those attacking areas and um, maybe um, creating chances? I think it's a fair point. I, I think when you look at the statistics of uses, yes, we can have a lot more there. And again, I think to go along with your point, um, you know, knowing that the division is going to be obviously evidently really good this upcoming season, we need to have better output. I, th I think for me, I think um, I think this is going to evolve around us having a better squad. I think you'll see a better output on either side of the pitch with a better squad. Okay. Um, you know, when we look at the squad and we see, again, obviously there's going to be more signings, but when we see the signings of Dan Kemp, when we see Louis Apare, when we, you know, with Freestone coming in, I think actually with us having a better squad, you'll see better output in those areas, to be completely honest with you. So, yes, look, I, I do agree it's going to be something that we need to probably improve on next season. Am I concerned? No, because I think with a better squad, those players will probably flourish a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. But, again, it's a very interesting debate because I really like both players. Mm -hmm. I really do. I think, you know, when you look at Luther... And He's such an athlete, Luther, isn't he, Luther Wild, and he can get from one end to the other so quickly. Yeah, and you said it, athlete. He is. The mm -hmm. athleticism to, mm -hmm. you know, get forward and, and then do his defensive responsibilities. But then when you look at Kane Smith, you know... Kane Smith's a flair player. He's got a lot of flair and aggression. And, he, you know, he gets forward defensively. He, he wins his tackles. He gets back in position. So, and, and again, actually, Kane Smith's delivery into the box is very underrated mm. as well. So, yeah. there's a real debate to be had there. Who who do I go with? Who who do I think Revs will go with? I think when you look at Luther Wilding, you'd probably put money on Luther Wilding. But again... I like Kane in League One. He's got those qualities mm -hmm. and responsibilities that will do well in this division. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy we've got both of them on that right side. Yeah, well, that's that's great position to be in. You always want that competition. Just going to uh, circle back to some of the comments. Uh, this is from Ryan, who's a Huddersfield Town fan. Hello, Gab. I'm looking forward to visiting Stevenage this season when the Terriers visit uh, for the first time uh, up the town. Uh, and then this is Ryan from his uh, other account. Uh, I will be visiting Stephen. Uh, never been before. I wonder why a championship team has no come in yet for him yet, if, if he's so good, apparently. Um, oh, yeah, that's uh, Tay Ashby Hammond, I think you're referring to. Um, so, yeah, Tay Ashby Hammond. Um, uh, gosh, a lot of comments there from Ryan. Thank you so much for getting involved. Um, let me move on. Uh, there's Claire being a bit 
bit cheeky. <laughs> Looking oh, forward to seeing you with some steamed liquid. Claire, you silly sausage, Claire. <laughs> That's not happening. Alex Ravel is coming to Edgley Park. I'll tell you what we're doing. We're coming to Edgley Park. We're taking three points of eating you know, all the pies because they're the best <laughs> pies in the world. <laughs> there we go. So hopefully you can um, make Claire eat her words. Um, uh, happiest fan in football central, what Charlie Keegan says. <laughs> you gotta have a look at that badge. They're in League One in the biggest ever season. <laughs> Go on. Brilliant. Uh, Jake Tong, I've only left Matt Farley. There you go. Um, so, um, there we go. So, a few, few comments there. Um, thanks everyone for, for getting involved. Really appreciate it. Um, so, um, Dan Butler, Matt, um, bit of a um. I, I really want to see some competition for Dan Butler come in next season. Um, I think you've got that if you play with the back four, but I think if you play with wing backs, I think he needs it because last season I really liked some of his deliveries. I love his sort of corner routines where he stands from a different sort of angle. I think some of yeah. his deliveries into the box are so, uh, his technique is really um, inventive. Um, but there is that feeling that he was sort of bombarded with starts last season. And in such a physically demanding role, you want what you have on the right side where you've got Luthien or Kane Smith. I think you want that on the left. And, and you know what? I honestly think we will get that. I think there will be a signing over the next three to four weeks where we see a, um, someone to come in a little bit, again, a little bit like a Kane Smith Luther kind of partnership mm -hmm. relationship that, that competes because you are so right. Dan Butler played 90% of the matches and you saw actually Dan Butler's a fantastic footballer at the level but you could see that fatigue in the last mm -hmm. third of the season it was noticeable so I think for us this season you know let's look to get in a, a, a competitive left back or left wing back that can compete with Dan Butler mm -hmm. a lot of people have said bring back Nesta Guinness Walker who could be potentially someone to come back but I, I think it might be someone different. I think Alex Ravel will look to bring in again a competitive left back to Dan Butler that, mm -hmm. like Kane Smith, can play. I, I think this is, you see, and, it, and it's similar to the Tay Ashby Hammond debate. Mm -hmm. When you have players that we call not reserves, I don't want to use that because that's the horrible term, but, but competitive players, I call them, to, yeah, to the sure. player that's going to start. You want players that can play and start. You don't no, want no players. stopping fillers. That's it. Like, for example, Reese Hannan. Uh, I'm sure Reese is a lovely chap, but we knew instantly that he wasn't good enough for the level. You want players like Kane Smith mm -hmm. for Luther Wilding that actually, when you get your team sheet, you go, oh, I'll tell you what, we could play Kane today or we could mm -hmm. play. And, and I think it needs to be the same in the left back position. Mm -hmm. When you want a player who you look at one day and go, actually, I prefer him to play. To. You want that competition. So I think for me, that is probably the only thing we need with that back line and we are done. I think if yeah, we I agree. bring in a competitive left back to compete with Dan Butler, totally agree. that line Ab is fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, Dan Butler, I want to sort of home in on Dan Butler himself because, um, um, in fact, I, I told you this uh, this anecdote of me randomly you're getting good into... Good pals you are, Gav, aren't you? Good kayak pals, aren't you? I know. Well, I, I, what, do you know what ha what happened? I, I, I think I might have told you, but I, I'll tell. It's a really funny anecdote. So um, I was going to Peterborough to get my, <laughs> my passport renewed, right? And um, uh, basically this bridge had been closed off. Um, and um, so I, I was kind of the next bridge that was accessible was like miles away. So what I did was I had this appointment to get my passport, at, you know, within half an hour or something. So I was, I was saying to this um, this guy who ran canoes, you know, could I pay you to, for you to row me uh, across the other side of the river because I can't get across the bridge? Um, and he, he very, to be fair, he kindly ag agreed. Um, but Dan was actually in the same boat, as it were because um, he needed to pick his kid up from uh, from school. So we ended up sort of getting into this boat. I was ve very clumsily, because I'm not necessarily the most... I I'm I'm getting in a boat with a professional athlete, Matt. So Dan got in with <laughs> consummate ease, and there was me sort of struggling in, trying to get my long legs in. Um, and um, so we were rowed across, and we had a little bit of a chat whilst being rowed across, and I think Dan... Dan filmed it or something. And then um, getting onto the sort of rocks on the other side was really awkward. And Dan was amazing for helping me up and he was giving me a hand and everything like that. And he was saying, you can do it, you can give me a hand. And, and, and I was I was very tentative about that, but I also didn't want to sort of shame myself up in front of a professional athlete. 
properly. Uh, so I got there in the end, um, but it was it was great, it, and it was it was funny. We just kind of got talking by yeah by we sort of recognised each other before we got on the canoe by chance. Yeah. Thing. Um, and yeah, it was it was it was great to it was great to meet him. In slightly uh, slightly surreal circumstances. I just I just I couldn't believe it. I remember you <laughs> sent me the video, and uh, Gab, I'll be honest. I went to the kayak. I went. Gab's in a kayak with Dan Butler. <laughs> All of them went. What? Well, have a look at this. Everyone was like, "Sorry, how has that come about?" I went because Gab needed to get from A to B. Yeah. Don't ask me how. Dan Butler's there, but he is for some bizarre reason, and he's giving him a little like it was just. But you, you looked so frightened. You, you were like, I know, yeah, I was, oh, I was terrified. I was trying to because the the um, the kayak was like tipping one way when the other, and, and I'd I'd had like a kayaking uh, accident as a kid where a boat sort of capsized oh, and I had to swim oh. back or get get a jet whatever to, to the shore so i was very a a anxious about it uh, so i was trying to keep the balance as hard as possible so when he was saying say hello to the camera or whatever i was like i was very, that very was unreal. Mate, I, w I wish i was you i wish i was <laughs> you'd you. have loved that wouldn't you you no, wouldn't have minded <laughs> my left back dan could you keep me in the kayak for the rest of your journey it would have been me mate. what about that what about that with me there's no way hiding it <laughs> Oh, brilliant! brilliant. Um, but um, but I, sh I suppose that kind of shows um, he's clearly a very good character, and I think you couldn't have got through that volume of games in such a physically demanding role without having a very good mentality. And um, I guess that sums up Dan Butler. But I love his deliveries as well. Yeah, and I think that I think as well, right? I, I know we talk about games. But the professional footballers they want to play, don't they? They want to play every game. I mean, if you're a player and you're a professional, well, not even a professional footballer, but let's say. If, uh, you know, the sake of the conversation, professional footballer, you want to play every game. So, you know, all, all right, I know it's physically demanding if you're playing 46 games a season or 44 games a season, but you want to play. So I, I think the thing with Dan is um, not only is he professional, but he loves the game. He wants to play. And when, you, when you're, when you you know, a, an individual in his position, let's say, you want to play every game. So mm. I, I think the great thing with Dan as well is, you know, when we talk about relevant experience to the level you look at him as one of those players man he's a very very important player and you know what he is a vital player for this season mm -hmm. that's upcoming because we're going to need to you know beckon on players like your Dan Butlers like your Thompsons who have got League One you need that this season so mm -hmm. I think I think Dan Butler's a wonderful footballer and mm -hmm. um, I think he's a very important part of how we want to play. And again, to go along with your point, great deliveries is something that we're going to need this season. Yeah, absolutely. I love those ones where he sort of chips them in a certain angle and he gets the, I can't, don't even know how to describe it. But he, like, he it's like a really... wand, isn't it? It's like a left yeah. head wand. Oh, like absolutely. That. Yeah, the way he sort of flicks his boot and kind of... Um, so, um, central midfield. Um, that, to me, um, Matt, if we're including the number 10 positions in this as well as the six and your eights and what have you, I think this is a really competitive area because um, you've got Jake Forstakowski there, um, you've got Nick Freeman, you've got Ben Thompson, you've got Louis Thompson, you've got um, Jordan Roberts and you've got Dan Kemp. I mean, I think that's not even mentioned Harvey White, by the way, who was really highly rated at Tottenham Hotspur yeah. as well. So that is a, a really exciting set of options, I think. You know what, Gab, my team, when you're saying that, I'm just patting that and going, that's, that's, that's my midfield for the brand new League One season and it's going to be the toughest it's ever been. That's my team. Well, and by the way, mate, I am over the moon with that. Like, when you look at that midfield mm. and you think, you know, toughest ever season ever for us as a club and as a team, I'm going to hone out on that. And, you know, one of the toughest ever divisions in League One, that's a midfield you want. Do you know what I mean? I mean, when yeah. we signed Dan Kemp, I was like, wow, that is... I know Dan Kemp's obviously played for us in the past, but that is mm. the signings that you want to make. So, again, it's 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 the same. I'm going to use an example here, and I'm going to steal it. It's, it's cool. Alex Ravel's, and Alex Ravel said this in his, in, his, in his press conference when he became manager. I remember being there. And he said, we're very close to being a really successful team in this division. But it's like, we've, it's a very funny analogy, but it's true. It's like we've got a cake, right? And we've got this great cake, it's a fantastic cake. 
But we can have a better cake. And at the minute, we're sprinkling a little bit of sugar and ice on this already really good cake. Mm -hmm. But we know that if we sprinkle this bit of icing and sugar on this cake, we're going to make yeah. this fantastic looking cake. And, and that's what you know what I, I think Carl Pejani is like the eggs of the cake. Do you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jake it's like the, the, the squirty cream on top. Ab yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, exactly. Um, you know. you, you've got uh, you got the flour with uh, with uh, Louis Thompson, <laughs> <laughs> and, you've, and you've got you've you've got the molding hands of Tay Ashby Hammond. There you go. You got it Absolutely, all. very good. Oh, oh I like yeah. that. That's but, brilliant. But I like. I like the example because it's so true. We know that this league is going to be better. So we have to be better. So mm -hmm. it's about sprinkling icing and sugar and an already mm -hmm. very good cake. And if we do that, we will be better. We'll be fine. So I think when you look at that midfield and you see Louis Thompson, Dan Kent, Jake Foster coming, mm -hmm. again, who plays? I mean, we know deep down that Jordan Roberts and Dan Kent have to play. Yeah, really, Dan Kemp, I, would you say Dan Kemp is a certainty he has to play? I would. One million, I just think he's such a fantastic footballer. I, I think he'll play. I, I, really I, I, I disagree with you, Matt, because this is the reason. If we're going along the lines of Steve Lynch playing 3-4-1-2, it might not be, but let's, sort of, let's yeah. explore that. You've got two central midfield spots, and then what, the number 10, I'm thinking, is Jordan Roberts. And Dan Kemp is going to, in, going to play in the number in one of the two midfield spots. Or and the, the midfield, you've already got loads of yeah. quality midfielders competing for two central spots. Well, well, this is this is my issue. In in my opinion, I think Jake Forster Kasky would play as well. So it's a bit like, hang on a second, we've got Louis Thompson, Dan Kemp, Jake Forster Kasky, Jordan Roberts, Nick Freeman, Ben Thompson, Harvey White. I'm assuming that at Revs is probably probably might sign another midfield player. You're looking going, who starts? I mean, Dan Kemp is such a wonderfully gifted footballer, but then you look and you go, but Jake Foster Kasky is Nick Freeman is a real solid player for them. Matt, is there not a bit of a question? I, I I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. Um I, I totally get the enthusiasm for Dan Kemp. He was amazing for half a season at Hartlepool. His inform there was incredible. Um his uh, form at Swindon as well for half a season was brilliant as well. When he's gone back to MK Dons after those loan spells, he hasn't necessarily lit everything up. And you would say, unlike a lot of the midfielders you've got, so Jake Forsakaski, Nick Freeman, Ben Thompson, Louis Thompson, um, are, uh, Jordan Roberts, they're all League One proven. Dan Kemp isn't League One proven yet. No, I, I, look, you make a very good point. And, and I think when you look at that, you can understand, actually, is, is Dan Kemp going to be amazing at level? And look, I, I, I've watched a lot of football. I've seen a lot of players. And when you see a player with real raw ability, you can kind of get a good understanding whether sure. they're going to be... And don't get me player. wrong, I really like Dan Kemp. I think he's a great yeah. ball carrier. I think when you build the team around him, I think he's an extremely yeah. exciting player. So I'm not... I'm, I'm not I, I think it's a really good signing. I, li I like the signing. Don't, don't get me wrong on that. But I think to say that he has to play and he goes straight in as the star player i for me that's a little bit premature i i think i think that he's got to fight for his place and i think it's yeah, going to be very don't get me wrong i think he'll have to fight for his place i think pre-season is very important Revs is going to be playing different systems different players and i think you know whoever performs the best and shows the best in the formation or the the, the setup that Revs wants to play will play i just think he's a really good footballer and I, and I think when we made that signing it was a little bit of a standout moment for me where i've kind of gone wow you know, he, he, you know, what a signing, what a player to have in this division. I, I think as well with Dan Kemp, I, I like his ability. I think for the way that League One's going to be, you need certain players like that who are going to get you on the board, who are going to create and who are going to get... Mm -hmm. I, I almost think with the league that we're going to be playing in, you, and Jake Forsakowski, I think, is the same. You need those players who are just going to get you the ball back and just get you going at things again. And I, and I think Dan Kemp is that type of player. I think he, he has delivery into the box. Mm -hmm. You know, when we look at his... You know, he's, he's, he's free kicks and he's corners and he's statistics and assists. And, you know, he, I, again, I know at League One it, it's not vast, but I, I think he, similar to players that we brought up to this division, I think potentially he could be very good in League One. Mm. And, and in my opinion, I think when we get to the start of the season, he, he will be a starting player for us. I, I really feel...
that Red has brought him here to be one of the stars. It, it might, I could be wrong, mm -hmm. but in my in my opinion, I think that's the case. Okay, I'm I'm going to disagree with you on, on that actually, Matt, because I think um, I think it's. I personally think it's Roberts or Dan Kemp because I think they're such similar players. And I think that it would be too unfair to Jordan Roberts to drop him for the first game of the season. So for me, I would actually start with Dan Kemp on the bench and give him the opportunity to grow into the season because I think he would be a fantastic impact player. But for me, I think I'm looking at the squad right now. I think Stevenage's best midfield would be Jordan Roberts, Louis Thompson, maybe Jake Forstakaski. Something like some sort of combination like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think JFC is a good shout. I think obviously we need to see if JFC is fit. I know that okay. obviously JFC had a bit of a. I don't know if he had surgery. I think he might have had surgery. I'm not not hundred percent, but I know that obviously he picked up a nasty little injury. So I'm hopeful to see JFC back back to normal when preseason comes around. I, I, I think I think in my opinion, I think yeah, I think those three would probably be one of the three standout midfielders. It'd be interesting if he played Dan Kemp instead of Jordan Roberts. I think that that, I think be... what you want to do is send the message to the new signings that you've got. You're not coming in and just starting from the off. I think what you want to do is sort yeah. of flood the new signings in because that way you you make your, your existing players feel valued for what they've done for the club mm -hmm. over the past two seasons, and you're also sending a motivational message to your new signings. So it's like a meritocracy, if you like. So for me, I keep Dan Kemp as a as a lovely option, you know, up your sleeves, if you like. Uh, a yeah, great. No. Yeah, and I do. I do agree with that. I think the great thing about Dan coming in is again, it's going to provide competition for places. That's for sure. Uh, in the midfield, I, I really like him. I, I kind of think knowing that knowing the guy that Alex Ravel is, I, I think he'll he'll really want to include Dan Kemp quite a lot because of his ability and his quality on the ball. And I think League One next season, you're going to have to have that. It's again, as we talk about the back line, it's a very nice problem to have. Mm -hmm. And I think pre-season is going to be very telling because we will see the style and the formation. I mean, you know, Alex Ravel might want Louis Thompson, Dan Kent, Jordan Roberts all to play, but it, it, but it's whether how he moulds that style. What, what no, I, I, I think I think it would be too open because you've got Jordan Roberts as your ball carrier, Dan Kemp's a ball carrier. I think you can't give them both freedom simultaneously because you'd end up getting overrun in midfield. I think you need two midfielders who are solid um, who are, and, and provide that, give you that grip hold on the midfield. Um, yeah. And I think that if you have two ball carriers who are given a lot of freedom in your system, I think that would debalance it. But bearing in mind, you won promotion with, uh, what was it, 5 3 2? Uh, so yeah, Lock we changed it, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Or, or sometimes you played with a, a 4 4 2 diamond uh, where you That's had one it. player at the tip, but then you still had another three midfielders who were providing the solidity. So for, for me, that's kind of where I would be thinking. Um, yeah, so Jake Forster Casket, do you know when, what the time scale of, is of his um, sort of return? All we knew is that when he did it at Carlisle uh, back in kind of March, April time, we knew that it would be till next season. Uh, okay. So we, we never really knew the the kind of trajectory or the time scale of what he was going to be out for, but we knew it would be next season. I, I, I would say he, he'll be back training in pre-season, I think. But whether he's ready to go right at the start okay. or will be a little bit standoff. But I think he'll be back for pre-season. Do you, would you describe Jake Forstakowski as your most technical midfielder, or would you say that's uh, Louis Thompson or Ben Thompson or Jordan Roberts? That's a, that's a really difficult question because I think all the midfield players we've got are very technical. Okay, yeah. um, I, I think it's really. I think when you're talking about who's one of the most technically gifted that has proved it at the level, I think Jake Forstakowski comes into that 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 equation because he's he's done it for Charlton. I know he had injuries. In the he was set piece taker at Charlton with those left foot exactly. deliveries. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think when you're talking about technically gifted players that have shown it at the level, Jake Forstakowski is within that mm. bracket. Um, I, look, I think Jake Forstakowski is a, he's a very, very important player. And as I said about Dan Kemp, I think this season we, we're going to need those players that are going to get us on the ball and are going to create things. When you look at the the teams that are in the division that have come down or come up, there's some really good football insides there. And, and I think 
we, we're going to need those Jake Forster Caskies, the, the Louis Thompsons, the Dan Kev, you know, just to get us back on the ball and get and get our game going in the game. And I think what Jake Forster Caskey does so well is he gets you the ball back, he gets you playing your game, he gets you on the ball. And again, I'm, I'm hopeful that we see JFC fit for the start of the season because mm -hmm. I, I think he's a really important player for us. Mm. Yeah, hopefully you can sort of ease him in. Um, I think um, of the two Thompsons you brought in in, in midfield, uh, let alone the three you had uh, you brought in overall. Um, I, it seems like the common consensus is that Louis Thompson maybe had the better season of the two. Uh, so possibly keep it up for Louis Thompson, and hopefully Ben Thompson can get to the levels we know he's capable of. Yeah, definitely. I think Louis played a lot more as well. When you look at the actual appearances, I think Louis, Louis had a lot more. I think with Louis as well, is, again, we talk about that experience at the level. He's got that. Um, and I think as well with Louis, when you look at that midfield, we, we do need a player that's going to do the dirty work in front of the back line. And I like what Louis Thompson does. Again, we're going to need that this season. I like the way he'll win the ball back for you. I like the way that he'll be brave in challenges. And, and do, do you think he can do the Finn Burns sort of role then, Matt? Yeah, it's sim similar. I, I think he can, yeah. I, I think, I, mean, I don't know how old Louis is now. I, I think he's in his 30s or late I'm, 20s. I would guess early 30s, something like that. I, I think he's, I mean, look, he's, still, he's still in good years of, of, of his pro career. So, I, yeah, I, th I think that kind of Finn Burns role he can partake. But again, he's a, he's a very important player. You know, when I, when I look at this upcoming season, and, and it's unreal again, the division we're in, when I look that we're going to be going to Birmingham, Rotherham and Huddersfield and Wrexham, you know, who are the players that you want playing in those games? You want your Louis Thompsons playing, the, the, the players that are used to playing at these grounds, the players that have done it for years in their career. You want those players. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, Louis, uh, from, from, a, from not just a playing ability, but from a mentality point of view as well, you want those players involved in that squad. So I think Louis is a very big player. I think he'll play a lot more this season, actually. I think Revs will look to involve him a lot more than he was last year mm. um so i i really like him i think he'll play a lot this season and i mean i think you've always got to be careful with louis thompson to not maybe bombard him with games as well because he does have a bit of a history of injuries hopefully you can put that behind him um but i i also think that there's possibly a scope for other players to come into the equation and i think you want to use that depth that you've got in midfield um because well, uh, sorry Gab, i was going to say um don't be surprised if um we go back to the defensive issues in terms of picking the squad. Don't be surprised if Rev goes, do you know what? I wouldn't mind seeing Terence Van Kooten part of the Louis in there. Interesting. Wouldn't be surprised. Huh. Um, so do you think maybe a thought that could work like with a 4-2-3-1 with maybe shifting Dan Kemp out wide or something like that? That's my point. I, I mm. think... Revs will look at it and go, well, I want a lot of those creative players playing, actually. With, with, with uh, the bat line we've got at the minute, when you've got Freestone, Pete, Swings, Nathan, is there an opportunity, actually, to put some legs in with Louis and put Terence in there and, and use those other players with the, the, the players in the final hmm. third? That could be an option for us. That could be an yeah. option. I think I think using the versatility of somebody like Terence Van Keaton makes sense because um, you, you might... You don't want to have so many players that you can't um, uh, you can't use use them all. And actually, Terence Van Kooten has got that defensive instinct similar to someone like Finn Burns, and that might allow Louis Thompson to bring his quality to the equation more freely. So again, that's a really interesting option, I think. Um, yeah. Talk to me about um, Ben Thompson then, Matt, and the season he had last year. Yeah, very solid. I, again, I think Ben's one of those players that didn't play enough. I think I think Ben should have played a lot more than he played. Um, you know, again, when I go back to the, you know, which players do you want playing at these big grounds in this division, he comes under that bracket. He, for me, he didn't play enough. I, th I think Ben okay. should have played a lot more than he played. And when mm -hmm. Ben did play, he played very well. Um, so I think for us going into this season, he needs to be more of a regular, in my opinion. He needs to be someone that is played a lot more in that middle of the pitch. I think the good thing as well about Ben, he's had a season now, so he, he, you know he's been playing. I say regular, I, know, I say he hasn't played a lot than he should have done, but he's had a season in the bag. Let's get Ben back playing a little bit more than he should be. And again, I think Ben, 
we, we talk about kind of versatility with football, with, with sides. He offers that, doesn't he? He's got that right side pedigree. And, you know, when we look at our squad, we're very left heavy in the midfield, aren't we? JFC, um, Dan Kemp, Jordan Roberts, even Louis Thompson's left foot. Mm -hmm. We're very left heavy. So I think the, the good thing about Ben is he offers that right side kind of ability as well. And I think that's very important with our squad. So um, I, I think he's a very important player. I think he's someone that, like Louis Thompson, is one of those experienced League One players. We definitely need him this season. Um, and I, in my opinion, would look to play him a lot more, even if it's bringing him off the bench in games and letting him yeah. change games like he does really well. But he should be involved a lot more this season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, right-footed balance, I think, is a really important thing. I think he can play as a number 10 or possibly a number 8. I don't think you can quite do the number 6 role, because um, I think he needs a bit more freedom than that and probably going to be better alongside either Louis Thompson or possibly someone like Terence Van Kooten that you mentioned um, that's going to stay a bit more disciplined. Um, and then um, I wanted to ask you about uh, Nick Freeman as well, because at Wickham he had this... Um, this tendency to kind of cut inside from from the left onto his onto his right foot. So does he suit one of those kind of wider midfield positions? I guess. Yeah, he does. Do you know what as well, Gab? He's got really good delivery. And actually, mm. if you go and watch Nick Freeman's highlights for us last season, a wonderful deliveries into the box. Mm. I mean, the amount of times I remember wigging away where Nick Nick's got this ability, Gab, where he'll get the ball and he'll go deep down the byline and he'll and he'll wing across it. Mm. And if you want to go and watch. A typical uh, highlight of Nick Freeman. Watch the Wigan goal for Carl Piagiani. He gets the he stands his defender up. He gets deep to the byline. You think, oh, he's not going to get the ball, and he gets the ball all the way across. Piagiani goes bang, goal two two. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like him. He's got very good delivery. And again, when we talk about Ben Thompson adding, you know, that kind of balance to the midfield of the right side, Nick does as well. But mm -hmm. what, again, and I say it again. League One experience has, has experience getting pr at promoted in this division. Um, and again, I would like to see him play a lot this season, Nick. I, I think, as you say, he can play a, a wider right-sided role. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something else about Nick as well, and we've got cover there, as we've said, with Luther and Kane Smith. He can actually do really good defending duties as well. So right, yeah. Defending, you, you, like, for example... Well, he's played for Man, Wickham under Gareth Ainsworth, Matt, so he's kind of... Yeah. You, you've sort of ingrained that you, you don't get in a Gareth Ainsworth team if you don't have the work record ethics track back when you need to. So. That's it. Let's say it's, it's versatility again, Gab, isn't it? Let's say Luther Wilding's suspended or Kane Smith's injured. You could put you could put Nick Freeman right wing back and he'll be mm -hmm. fine. You'll do a job. He'll, he, yeah. he'll get forward for you. He'll, he'll, if anything, actually, you, you'd probably say Nick Freeman in terms, of, uh, in terms of his delivery is probably better than Luther and Kane Smith. So you've got right. that, you've got that versatility there. Defensively, he does really well as well, so because he works hard. So uh, Nick's a very important player. Again, versatility is a very important thing. Nick, Nick gives us that, and I think uh, he will be very important for us this season. Yeah, so I'm I'm trying to put together the, the ideal midfield um, combination. If you you're, you're thinking sixes, eights, and tens, and again, it's very much like that centre back um, spot, isn't it? Yeah. Matt? It's just so hard to um, to sort of pick the the best three or four or whatever. I uh, Gab, I have no idea. I, honestly, my man, I am. I'm like you. I'm like I, I'm. I'm looking forward to Jersey, my man. When we get to see it all, play. oh, here we go. Yeah. This is what we do. I'm. I don't know. I don't have a clue. I mean, it, it, if, do you think, it, Matt? Do you think a box because it's such an area of strength? Do you think you could go for a box midfield to actually maximise maximise that area of strength? You could, I, I, and this is why I'm a little bit like, is he going to go a diamond? Maybe because he thinks, well, we've got all this quality in the midfield. Should we just play a formation which caters for those abilities? Does, does he go a Thompson, Kemp, Roberts and Nick Freeman or Ben Thompson on the right and what does he, he I, I'm a little bit like which formation does Alex because the way I look at it is which formation does Alex Ravel play to get the best out of our team and when I look at the midfield that we've got I think actually would a diamond suit that or or is he going to go two there with three in front and one or I, I don't have a clue what he's going to go so, yeah, I mean, the diamond you could play, possibly TVC at the base, and then any combination, you know, maybe Jordan Roberts at the tip, and then do you go Nick Freeman, do you go um, Louis Thompson? Certainly Louis yeah. Thompson might be one, 
one of the two wider spots. Um, so maybe Thompson and Freeman initially, while JFC. I was going to say something. Could you imagine if it was something completely different? You played a four-three-three, and we were like, "Oh my god!" Like it was just something completely <laughs> random, and it was like, "What's going on?" It like Dan Kemp out left. Yeah, even out right. Could you well, well you actually, to be fair, for you could play like a Christmas tree sort of formation where you have yeah. Kemp and Roberts out wide, Jamie Reed down oh. middle, and that still allows you to get three midfielders in. Oh, could you imagine it? Though? It, it, it would be interesting to see, wouldn't it? Mm. But again, like when we look at Alex Ravel, mm -hmm. and again, I think pre season's massive because the last time Revs was manager, he liked to 4 4 2 4 3 3. Mm -hmm. I don't think that will be the case now. And I think he's learned possibly where he went wrong in the past and what he needs to do with this team that we've got because you play to the team that you've got. Sure. Um, but I'm so excited to see those pre-season matches, what mm -hmm. he plays, the system, the players. So we'll get a good feeling for it when we, when we play these pre-season games, what he's going to go with in the season. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested because when you look at our midfield, when you look at the back line, you're looking around, and again, I think it's a really good debate for us. You're looking going, well, he can start, he can start, mm. Actually, we can play this way, we yeah. can play that way. But but again, and I'm going to go back to it, you need to have that in this division. You have to, you have to have versatility and, and you have to have your plan A, your plan B, your plan, you yeah. have to have it. And, and we've got it, we've got it. Yeah, what I do, I mean, I, what I do like about this is that um, it's going to make um, in-game management um, a lot easier because you've got players who can come on and change things up and you've got ways of changing strategy when you need to. So that's a big plus. There's also part of me, though, Matt, that almost thinks you've got to... Um, Sometimes you've got so many choices. Does it make it harder to um, stick to a um, a really clear first eleven? Because when I, you know, if I look at the first half of the promotion season, it was like you knew that eleven from about sixteen would start. Whereas now Ravel's got to pick from pick eleven from you could argue twenty two, or it's certainly not sixteen. It's it's nineteen. It's twenty. Do you know what I mean? So it's. It's going to be harder as well to pick pick the 11, possibly. I, I think I think having a smaller squad, and what I mean by smaller squad is 20 to 22 man squad is probably ideal because of okay. that point. I think I think when you look at the promotion season, I think what was so special about that group is Steve Evans had a 20 to 22 man squad. It was all very close. It was all very, you mm. know, again, it, I used it on your thing. No stocking fillers. Every player's a starting player. That's how we go into games. So I well, well I, thought, I thought, Matt, I thought the first 16 or 17 were no stocking fillers. And then after, once you got to 18 or 19, some of them were, didn't really get used in the first half of the season. And then you recruited in January. And actually, when you had a much bigger squad in January, form actually dropped. And it was only when you won five of the last six that got you over the line. Um, well, yeah, we, we, we had a lot of injuries. And yeah, I think sure. what happened with yeah. that squad is... We got to January and the squad had thinned quite a bit. So we we had to recruit. Yeah, um, I get you. Yeah, to, to get us over the line, and then luckily, as all good managers do, Steve was able to get us over the line with, with six to go, with five wins or so. But I think for us, I think what's important with Revs is having a, a not small squad, but sm like a like a feeling of a small squad. He needs to have a team where every player plays a part in the squad, and that's where he oh wants no, to get your Stevenage, you get your Stevenage towel oh. up again. Honestly, it's got windy here. What's going on? <laughs> there we go. Still got the stag in. Still got the stag. In. You just can't see the you see the football club bit. Um, but no, I think I think Reds needs to 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 have uh, a relatively small squad where he builds it in a way where every player's got a role in the squad. Whether you're not <laughs> starting, whether you are, you, you're expected to play and do well. So I, I think that's important. But I actually think if you look at the recruitment that we've made. We are building that. You know, when you look yeah. at the squad and you see Freestone, player that's going to want to play, Dan Kemp, player that's going to want to play, even Louis Apparay, player mm -hmm. that's going to want to play. So he's building, again, when I talk about the sprinkling of the icing and sugar on an already excellent, it, it's that feel to it. So I think when the season comes around in August, you're going into a game going, oh, you know, who's going to play? What's going to be? That's the feeling you want. And yeah, uh, for me, we're, we're right on it at the minute. We're, we're right on it. But... Um, because it's going to be exciting. About that. I don't know what we're going to play. Like, like I think, I think with our squad, the givens are 
Trash be having, <laughs> Carl Pigiani, Jamie Reed. They're, they're your three givens around yeah. that. It's a bit like, who's going to play? Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. Well, I would I'm argue Louis them. Thompson is close to a given. I would maybe put him yeah. in that category. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you um, probably will, with the experience as well, yeah. Yeah, so so I'm not going to let it go, Matt. Midfield, who would you, if you, you're Alex Rebell, who are you going to pick? I'm not I'm not letting you up easy. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to rub the badge to give me power of thought, Gab, because okay, I am struggling. Right. Or, or I could pick up this glass of beer here that I'm not going to show you, but I could do Oh, Gab, what a question. Um, oh, I, I think for me... I'd like to see the three at the back, right? I'd like to see that, okay. which then means that it's going to be a three, isn't it, in the middle with two up. So mm -hmm. I think if I'm looking at it, I'm probably going, oh, God, I'm, I'm going, oh, God, I'm going, I think Louis Thompson will play. Okay. Uh, oh, oh. I would go Louis Tom as as like you're playing in front of the in front of the middle that wins you the ball. I'd go Louis Thompson, and then I would go. Oh God, because I really like Dan Kemp. I really yeah, like Dan Kemp him. Second striker, Matt, alongside Louis. Uh, you know, do you know what I like? I again, but I do get your point earlier of how open is it going to be. I really do like the the Louis Thompson kind of midfield player that wins the ball back. Then I like I like the tri the two free players of Roberts and Kemp. I like that, but then again, is he is he going to go with that? Is it for me? No, I'm gonna. I'm gonna I think I think Louis pressure. Thompson on his own. If if Roberts and Kemp get freedom yeah. to go forward, I think uh, I think uh, Thompson on his own gets overrun personally. Yeah, I, I mean, is there a world he plays Thompson and Kemp? I don't um, I would go, if it's the three, you want to keep it well balanced, don't you? So I would go Louis Thompson. I think I think based on the last couple of years, you'd, you'd probably go with Jordan Roberts, I think. Uh, and I think uh, on the other side, to create that balance, um, I would like to see um nick freeman yeah i was gonna go nick freeman probably nick freeman because i like okay. the way that nick has the ability to deliver and do mm -hmm. i think with louis thompson there you want that defensive responsibility as well and nick freeman really yeah. does offer that mm -hmm. so i think if, if if you're asking me now what i would choose for my midfield in the opening day league one that would be it but Jeez. I really like Dan Kemp. I'm not letting it go. I I really think there's going to be a place that he plays. So so I've managed to talk you over from Dan Kemp has to start to and you know I've got you to name a midfield three. No, 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 I'm changing it. I'm changing it. Take Freeman out and put Kemp in. I'm calling it. Dan, I'm calling it. Take Freeman out. No, sod it. Okay. Sod that. I'm going Thompson, Kemp, Roberts. I'm playing them. They'll be fine. <laughs> They'll be fine. I'm not having it. You, you were no, me tell down, you what, it. Though, what I do like about the uh, the first option you suggested is I think um, you got uh, the relationship between Nick Freeman and Luther Wildin. So you got Nick uh, mm -hmm. Luther Wildin flying forward with his athleticism that can create space for Nick Freeman to dink his yeah. deliveries in. And then on the left, you've got Dan Butler and Jordan Roberts. So you've got Jordan yeah. Roberts who yeah. can do his running to create space for Dan Butler to cross. So both, so those two, I think, would have really good relationships. But you've also got Nick Freeman and Jordan Roberts who can sort of chip in as conventional midfielders to help out with Louis Thompson. So I, I really do like that idea. Um, yeah. But then we come to the to the striker position, which. Um, although you've got Jamie Reid there, who was um, outstanding last season, I don't think that the striker position is quite as strong as a um, position, maybe, as um, or as a group of options, as maybe midfield and defence. I, 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 I think, um, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's quite at that same level where you're having, yeah, scratching your head, thinking who's going to play sort of thing. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, if you want my opinion, I think there'll be another striker signed. Okay. I think, I think Rex. I think Rex will probably bring in another striker. Um, I do you think, think. Do you think the press could get offloaded then? 
uh, Listy or the press, I think if you're a better man, would probably say one of them two will probably get offloaded, maybe. Um, See, Listy, I, I think, think, can have a role from the bench, Matt, because I, I think do. he's got that I pace do. and he can... We saw at Cheltenham, didn't we? Like, off the bench, he's electric. Yeah. I, I do. I, I, I think there's a role with Listy. A lot of said he's Listy up for the level mm. in League One, maybe League Two is probably his level. I mean, I, I think Elliot List can do very well in League One. I think... I think with Red, who he's done well under the past in the past, sorry as well. I think there's an opportunity for Listy to to have a successful season. I think what I'll say is, what was the one thing that let us down last season? It was goal. It was scoring goals. And I know we had Jamie Reid, mm -hmm. but when you looked around Reedy, we, we did like how many nil nils? Nil nil at Charlton, nil nil at Ireland yeah. against Park. Too many, too many draws, too many. Mm -hmm. And I think Revs knows that. We we know that. The back line, the midfield are, are absolutely fine. We need yeah. strikers. And mm -hmm. for me, I think there will be another striker coming that will be a really standout signing for us. And I think you'll have a group there when you go, Jamie Reid, Louis Appare, whoever the, the, the mm -hmm. other striker is going to be with those two. And, and by the way, actually, um, while we're on strikers, I really like Louis Appare for us. I, th I think for, for us, he's a good addition to the squad. I, th I, I like him. I like it. He's, he's not going to get you 20 goals. No. But he fits the style. He's very fast. Mm. He gets off the shoulder well. He's got. He's very aggressive. His um, hold-up play is really good. Yeah. I, think, I think there's a Northampton Town reporter called um, uh, James Hennigan, who um, one of the things he was saying was that although Louis Appare uh, didn't yeah. score so many goals last season, his all-round game was actually pretty good. And I would actually argue yeah. that if you're playing alongside an in-vogue centre-forward like Jamie Reid, who scored, got into the Northern Ireland squad, which is an amazing yeah. achievement. He scored twenty more than 20 goals, 23 was it in the end? Um, yeah. So I, I think if you're alongside a goal scorer like Jamie Reid, I don't actually think the other striker has to be prolific. I think they have to score 10 and I think they have to facilitate goals for both from Jamie Reid and elsewhere in the team. And I, I do feel like Louis Apre could do that. Well, I think what you're going to see as well, Gab, this season is I think you're going to see a lot more goals from the midfield. I, th I think that will be a... I think you'll see more goals. We've, we've came with... I think you'll see more goals. I think with Jordan Roberts. Well, what do you, what do you think has to happen, Matt, to, for the midfield to bring more out goals out of the midfield? It's a, good, it's a good question. I think the way that we played last season didn't particularly allow a lot of the midfield to get on the score sheet. I think the fact that we were so direct, and don't get me wrong, it works. Mm -hmm. uh, but I actually think, and we said a lot back into the season, play a bit more football, use mm -hmm. the midfield a bit more. And we were so direct that, that you never really got to see those players flourish in those roles. So I this think actually, Ruff, Matt, it's funny, sorry to, to interrupt, but I just a thought just occurred to me you saying that. I think Louis Lewis Freestone signing is gonna help with that because he's a really good ball playing defender. Yeah. Um yeah. so you put him into the defence, I think that's gonna make a difference how you're able to progress the play into midfield and you don't just necessarily have to go long. And and Gab, I think we'll play a lot more football. I, I think I think we have to. I, I think when you look at the league and you look at the sides, I think, I think we're going to have to play a bit more football. So I think we will see more contributions from the midfield because we will play a bit more football on the end. Mm -hmm. So I think naturally with the midfield, with Jordan Roberts, with Dan Kemp, with Freeman, I think you'll see more contributions. So in turn, it will take a little bit of pressure off the forward line. But mm -hmm. still... Apare will, will get you a solid minimum five or six goals. And actually, in our squad, if we're going to have the contribution from the midfield, it'll be more than enough. If Jamie Reid can, can continue form and get us over 10 goals, it'll be more than enough. So that, that's why I like the Apare edition. And also, I know we talk about Listy and Press, and we say, look, oh, one of them could be offload. There is a place for them. I mean, it, it's, it's not a, 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 you know, a certainty of, yeah, they, they need to be gone. There's a place for Aaron Presley. There's a place for Elliot List. It's just whether we bring in another top striker yeah. that can go well. You know I mean, I is? would argue that Aaron Presley was better than Vidane Oliver last season. Mm. Um, so, um, I th especially the way he started the campaign, he started pretty pretty brightly. Mm. So, uh, hopefully he can have a good pre-season and then bring himself into the equation. Oh, most certainly. And I, I, do you know what? I'm going to say something. I think Alex Vell really likes Aaron Presley. Okay. I what gives you that impression? I think Rev sees a little bit of himself in Aaron Presley of Lou. I think he looks at the press, tall striker, similar height to Rev's, similar work ethic. I think Rev actually looks at Aaron Presley and thinks, actually, I can mould a good striker out of you under me. 
from because you're you're similar in aspect to me and structure. I, I think he sees a good player in Aaron Presley. And you know what I do too? I think um I think when Aaron Presley was announced on the retain list, I know obviously we're not done yet, we're in June. I was surprised. I thought, actually, I wonder if Revs actually sees an opportunity to build a good striker with Aaron Presley. And, mm -hmm. and again, I think with Aaron Presley, he offers you that, that you know, something that the other strikers don't offer you. It's the height, it's, you know, the threat in the box. You know, when we talk about players like Dan Kemp, you know, delivery going into the box and Dan Kemp with players out. So there's that dynamic as well. So I, I think there's a there, there, there's an important place for the press. And I think the press could be very good for us this season. Well, it's got a season in the bag as well. So, yeah. um I, I like him. I think there could be a place. Mm. Yeah, hopefully he can he can lift his game uh, even another notch uh, under under Alex Travell's uh, guidance. Uh, I guess um, yeah, he's probably a little bit like Aaron Presley. You might say Harvey White in midfield. These players yeah. who could go under the radar and could you know completely surprise us all if they have an amazing preseason and and, and you never know quite how that's going because they both have very good pedigree. Like you don't um, you don't get picked up at youth level by Premier League clubs in both of those cases without without having some ability. So um, hopefully either of them can can sort of prove that. Um, but talk to me about Jamie Reid, Matt, and um, and his accomplishments last season. Oh, I love him, Gav. Oh, I love the guy so much. Do you know, actually, before I do, I was watching him play against Spain in May. He, well, start of June, Northern Ireland played Spain in a friendly before Spain comes here. He was being marked by Rodri. Wow. Gab. There's a picture of Jamie Reid winning a header against <laughs> Rodri. It's absurd. And he played he played really well. We nearly scored. Mm. He nearly scored that day when he right. played Spain. Um That's yeah, oh, no, Jamie Reid is Jamie Reid has uh has been fantastic. Again, I go back to the season where you know, Steve Evans came in and kept us up and you saw a glimpse and, mm -hmm. you know, it was almost like a diamond in the rough with Reed. Yeah. He actually, he could be a good goal scorer for us if you get the right people around him. And boy, did we do that. Your promotion mm -hmm. season, the improvement, you know, the, you know, big goal Reedy, the, the nickname, the important goals he scored for us, the big, big games and big moments helped us over the line. If it wasn't for Reedy, we wouldn't have been promoted. Um, when you look at the season just gone, you know, who would have thought he would have gone and knocked nearly 20 goals in the league one season and getting team of the year, by the way. That is, it's that for me. Team, you, Jamie Reid, Jamie Reid got himself in team of the year at the Football League. Awards. And that, it's not the goal. That achievement is fantastic to, yeah. to be recognised to do that. You know, the amount of goals, the accumulation of goals and, and what a player he's... he's He's become. There's there's been news that there's championship sides looking over him. He, mm -hmm. He's going to have that. He's a guy that's playing international football now and scoring goals internationally. Uh, you know, his international goal really, Gab. Not not big goal really anymore. But, um, international goal really. What a player. I do. Yeah. He's international goal really. Um, but what a player. What an improvement. And do you know what? Look, we don't know if Reedy's def definitely going to be here because we're in June and anything can happen. But you know what? If he's with us next season. I'm going to make a prediction. I think he's going to have a very similar season. I think he'll go and notch many goals. And then, end the next season, I think you'll see maybe a move to championship, possibly. Wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I, I think yeah. if he was five years younger, I think he'd already have championship clubs mm. queuing up. Yeah. But it's because he's, um, I believe, around the 30 mark. Apologies, Jamie, if I yes. got that wrong. I think he's about 30. Um, so I think that's probably one of the reasons, a little bit like Alfie May, perhaps, at Charlton, a little one of the reasons why you're able to get him in League One, keep him in League One, as opposed to um, being gazumped. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. Do you know what, Matt? I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on uh, another striker coming in because I look at it, right? Um, I don't know that you'd bring in Louis Appere, um if um, if you're planning to make another marquee striker signing. Because you, it might be that it's not given that you'll play two up top because of the strength in other areas. You might also consider Dan Kemp to come into the forward equation. So there's a world where you play three, you know, a front three with List and Kemp, possibly out wide as well. Um, and I'm kind of thinking you got Jamie Reid there, who's your big go-to. And if you, it's only one up top, he's definitely going to start. And then I just think Louis Appere. 
Um, I think it's going to be one of Upper A. Smith or Presley that starts up top with Jamie Reid, if you do play two up top, but I don't think that's a given. So I'm not convinced. We all thought you were going to make a marquee striker signing last summer and you, you didn't because you prioritised other areas. And I don't know, I feel like it might be the same this year. No, I do see your point. I, I, I think when you look and you see Reid, Upper A, Presley, there's a lot there. And again, we do talk about the point of, I think the midfield are going to probably contribute a lot more this season. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with the depth that we've got there now, with bringing Dan Kemp in and the original players like Jordan Roberts. Because again, people forget Jordan Roberts can score goals. I mean, you know, we we we've seen it with Jordan. You know, I know it was League Two and it was the promotion season, but Jordan knocked him with over ten goals. So Jordan Roberts mm-hmm. can score. Yeah. So you know, and Jordan Roberts can play striker. I know it's not his favourite position, but well, Kemp there is that. Play, Kemp could play as a second striker as well. I saw either of them. Yeah, yeah. one million percent. So, I think with Jordan, it, you know, there's, there's that option as well. I think Reds and, and the way that he spoke about the issues being the forward line, I wouldn't be surprised if he signed okay. another, another striker. Because I think with Reds, Reds knows if we're better in that final third this season with a better squad, we'll be fine. So, I, it, I do think we might sign another one. But if we did stick with the four we've got, I'd be fine. Because I think with Reed, Apare, Press, List, and then the players around that, Jordan Roberts, I think there's more than enough to stay up and do really, really well. Mm-hmm. But I do get this feeling that Alex Ravel thinks that we probably need another striker and that's what he'll probably go out and get. Well, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I, it's, it's funny, yeah, there, there probably are all um, question marks, if you like, or asterisks over all the other centre-forward options. So, again, it depends so much on what the formation's going to be and what the plan is. So, yeah, I, I can see your point there. So, uh, Matt, you mentioned expectation for next season being to stay up. Um, is, do you think after a team that finished ninth last season and hasn't hasn't lost any key players, you lost your manager and his assistant? I, I mean, unless I'm unless I'm completely missing, I don't think you've lost any key players. So, no. should the expectation to be to finish nineteenth next season, or should you be sort of setting sights a little bit higher after what you achieved last year? It's really difficult because the league's looking so good and. I think if the yeah, league was looking different, I think if you didn't have sides like Birmingham coming down and you didn't have sides like Wrexham coming up or stop, I think you'd look at it and go, yeah, let's get around that position and get a build. But I think when you look at that division, you know, it's not just... And by the way, Gav, it's not just the teams that have come into it. Bolton are still in the league. Mm. Blackpool Peter, are still there. Peterborough, Lincoln, you know... You know, it's not like Bolton went up and, and mm. Oxford say, you know, there's some big clubs. I think for us, get over that 50-point mark, hit that 50-point mark. It's like if we, and I said this to you on one of your old older um, uh, episodes, if we can stay up, we can stay up in nearly any League One because the <laughs> way the division's looking, if we could just stay up this season, Gab, it'll feel like winning the league, I swear to God. If we could just stay up and prove that we can do it in this league, we can do it in any League One. But I think, I, and I get your point, but I think for us, stay up, stay in the division, get the 50 points, get over that. And then whatever we do from there, I think, is just a bonus considering the, the league and what the division's going to be. It's going to be a very difficult division to finish in the top half this season for clubs like us. Um, it'll be the same for other clubs that are similar. So mm-hmm. I think for us, get over 50 points, do that. We And by the way, with Alex Ravel's first season back as manager with all this stuff in the pot, stay up. Alex Cavell's done a blooming good job. So I, I think for me, make sure that we stay in League One next season. I think he's done a decent job if you stay up. Uh, I think for him to have done a good job, I think you, you'd you say a mid-table finish because I know it's his first full season in the um, um, in of the second stint and you might still consider him a rookie. But this is a good squad as well. So, um, I th- and I think that pro- that probably, the, the name Stephen, you know, there's the name Stevenage, but actually it's quite, quite well backed as well by Phil Wallace as well. So um, I don't think you should lose your expectation entirely, but I, I do, uh, I think that's very reasonable of you to say um, that it's about getting to 50 points first. Um, and I'm sure that's where a lot of the fans are too. Um, where, uh, where are you, by the way, on the um, re- recruitment structure of the club, Leon Hunter, things like that? Are you still feeling pretty positive about all that stuff? Yeah, it's pretty good. I think we've seen it this summer. Some of the recruitment we've made has been fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. I think, look, it, 
it's one of the things that have been excellent over the last few years is, is recruitment for players. I mean, heck, it's been it's been great over the years. We just haven't had the right managers in the right positions to to do really well with us. But yeah, Leon Hunt is great. Le- Leon has a, a wealth of experience in bringing in players. Mm-hmm. I, I think with us, Gary, and, and you'll probably agree with this. It's not just bringing it's bringing the right players. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? You know, which players can we bring to make our team better and suit the style? I think it's not just, you know, I've seen a lot of players come to Stevenage Football Club. A lot of them haven't worked out. It's about bringing the right players. You know, when you when you bring the Cole Piagiani, you bring the Jordan Robert, you know, players that are, are, are the DNA, have Stevenage Football Club DNA. Though, those players that suit the style. Dan Kemp, Dan Kemp, brilliant player for us. Louis Appare got all the right attributes to be a great player for us. So I think it, it's about bringing the right players that suit the way that we want to play. And I think Leon does so well at that. And obviously, as the, that all comes from discussions with the manager. So obviously, Alex Ravel will tell Leon the type of players we want to look for. And Leon will go and recruit those players and give that list to Rev. So it's a great partnership. I love the structure of the club. The club's in a great place, by the way. Um, done really well financially again. Mm. Um, Phil, what, do you know what, Matt? Phil Wallace does so well because um, I think there's other clubs that are similarly sign, sized that um, actually struggle with finding uh, extra stri- strands of commercial revenue and actually can sort of stagnate a little bit because of that. But I think what Phil Wallace seems to do really well yeah. is to yeah. grow the club commercially. Um, and you seem to have a really good operation in that regard with some of the sponsorship deals you've had and how well you use the Lamex and all that kind of thing. Yeah, we're, and, and we're growing, Gab. I mean, the pitch for this upcoming season in League One, the biggest ever season, we've gone hybrid. So the pitch is going to look unreal. It's going to be like a... Oh, oh, it's going to be unreal. And I went down to... Uh, the oh, I saw the little the clip that you did with um with yeah. the presenter. Yeah, yeah, I went down to the club last Tuesday to do that. I had a little look at the pitch. Oh, real pitch is the best I've ever seen it. Uh, went into the changing rooms, went and had a look, and there's there's a lot of work going on. I I bought my um my new Stevenage Football Club League One merchandise by the pool today. I got the, the, right. the, the by the way, maroon polo top. Uh, it's something we've never done before. Ah, oh, look great, bought all that. Ready for the kits. The kits will be out in the next couple of weeks. Well, if Matt you get a P- Matt, if you get a Piagiani top, it'll say maroon five. Oh my god, Dad, stop it. Oh, you know what I'm gonna have to do? I'm gonna have to take Piagiani up and put maroon then, aren't I? No, I can't <laughs> do that. I can't do that. Um, but um but no, everything's been great at the club. To be honest with you, man, we, we are, and I know I am, but we are really passionate. We're ready to go. We're ready for it now. You know what? Euros, move aside, because we're ready for the new season in League One. Fixtures out in four, under 48 hours. We're ready. We're ready to go. We're passionate. We're behind revs. We're behind our team. We're going to prove a lot of people wrong again this season. And, uh, and I'm really, really passionate about this team that we've built in League One with Revs as manager. And you're going to see Scott Cuthbert running up the touchline in Birmingham, Gab, when Jamie <laughs> Reid brings over. Oh, it like you're going to see us, Gab. But no, we're, we're, my man, we're really excited. And I, I've got my season ticket. I've got everything. I can't wait, man. Get those Scott, pictures Scott out. Scott Cuthbert with his tattoos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just yeah, exactly. Right Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's going to be quite a season, potentially, uh, for Stephen and just uh, an incredible journey that you've had. So, to summarise everything that we've talked about, um, the reason I ask every guest, Matt, what are the reasons to believe that you'll meet your ambitions this season? From what I can see for Stevenage, it's that spine of Carl Pijani, uh, Louis Thompson, Jordan Roberts, and um, and Jamie Reid, and possibly Tayash Hammond you'd put in there as well. Yeah, I think I think the answer to that is as well. Uh, it, yeah, the core that we've kept, but I think it's um, making the team a better team. And I think the one thing that we'll do this season and why we'll meet expectations is we've kept the core. And as Rev said, sprinkle a bit of ice and sugar on an already excellent cake. And I think that will be the reason why we meet expectations. I think we'll we'll have a better team than than last season. I think we'll have a better team for this season. Uh, And I I think we'll we'll be fine. Look, it's going to be a tough division. There's some big clubs, big sides, a lot of money. But I think the, the, the team that we put together and that we're putting together will be enough and we'll be fine for the league. So uh, I think we'll meet expectations because the call we've kept and the fact that we're going to be a better team. 
let's hope that's the case. Um, it is a difficult question to ask you, Matt, because you're Mr. Positive. I've uh, come yeah. to know about this, about you, about this um, over the last few years. But if I had to ask you for one reason for doubt as to whether you oh. achieve your ambitions, what would be your one reason for doubt? Would it be the fact that Alex Ravel is still unproven as a, as a number one? Would that, if you had to say oh. one doubt, would it be that? Oh, you're sticking it there, Gavin. Um, no, no I'm, I'm a realist. I, like, even though I'm a massive positive freak, I can still be realistic. <laughs> um, I would say, yeah, I would say Revs. No, look, I, even me, I'm backing him and I'm so positive. But yeah, I think if you're looking at doubt, Revs, Revs needs to prove himself uh, after, <laughs> you know, a couple of years ago completely, 100%. You know, there's people at the club that are a little bit unsure of whether it's the right move. So, no, I think Alex Vella's manager, what's his in-game management like? What has he learned from the things that he did a couple of years ago? One million sure. percent. And you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll even put another. Goals. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I think when you look at the forward line, is that, is that forward line going to be OK? I think that mm -hmm. could be a... Could be a, could be another issue for doubt. I, I think sure. if you had to push me for two, the manager and, and the final third for goals. But I think it will be fine. But if you had to ask me for two, I'd say those two. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and obviously, it's a stronger league, which is your, your sort of your easy out, which I didn't give you. <laughs> yeah, that would um... be that as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But do you know what? Going back to Revs, I really like that. I think he said something in his press conference where he said he was very honest about saying I wasn't ready for it. Um, and, I, and I kind of found that really refreshing the, the first time around. Um, I found that really refreshing. So um, I think he's an honest person. And, and I think those sorts of qualities are going to translate really nicely. So uh, yeah, good luck to him um so um uh too early for a prediction obviously because it's uh, a lot can change between now and the end of the season but give me a number map between one and ten to let to denote your level of optimism that uh your, your ambitions will be met well as in ten being the top ten being the most optimistic which you normally you, you normally are <laughs> I'm going to give you an 11. No, I'm saying, I'm saying, <laughs> um, look, inside, inside of me, it feels 11, Gab. It's like that. But from the outside, do you know what? I'm, I'm, I'll give you a really solid eight. I, th I, th yeah. I think, I think, I think we can meet those expectations with the team that we've got. I'm not going to give you a 10 or a nine because you have to be really, I think a solid eight. I think we can meet those expectations of staying up and doing well. Yeah. Marvellous. Well, listen, Matt, it's been such a pleasure to have you on live from Turkey as well. Um, that's been amazing. Just quickly uh, uh, go through some of the co uh, the comments because I had a lot of them. Thank you so much. Um, uh, blah, 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 a big posit uh, Rich says a big positive is that, is that he knows the club very well, which is a great point. I think he raised that earlier. Um, uh, the man, the legend that is Pidge. Go on, Pidge. Um, <laughs> hi, Gab and Matt. Do, uh, do you think uh, Kemp and Roberts both start or do you think it'll be one or the other behind you so I think we disagree on this one um, that I I think it's going to be um, I think it's going to be one or the other for me it's Jordan Roberts but I think you you, you think it's going to be both so I've got to stick with but I, I you're did sticking with I both. Kemp that much I've got to stick with it I've got to stick okay um, uh, Jovi says uh uh, JFC injured for half a season though he thinks three three four two one with Kemp and Robbo as an at two number tens that could be very exciting couldn't it? Oh, um, that could work, yeah. That could work, yeah. That's a great idea. I was wondering about box midfield. Uh, Roberts is my favourite player, says Rich. Although he seems to affect the mood of the team. If he's not on his game, then I feel the whole team can suffer. We'll see. H hopefully, he can add that um, bit of extra consistency this year. Um, he uh, <laughs> Claire says, "Is there? He really is the most positive person ever." <laughs> Look at that team. Go on, there boy. you go. Um, Stephen Edge interview says Harvey White. I think will play more minutes this season too. That's yeah. an interesting point. We didn't talk about Harvey White much, but he's clearly a big talent. Um, Dean Gripton says, uh, "Great stuff. I'm loving that enthusiasm as usual." And um, Stephen Edge interview says Neil Bamfield is going to be big for us in my opinion 
assisting Alex Ravel reminds me of when we brought in Dean Wilkins to assist him the first time around. Well, there we have it. Um, thank you so much, Matt, for, for joining me on this podcast. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us at home. Uh, get yourself subscribed to YouTube and on Spotify to EFL Debate. This has been one of the many summer deep dives, the 72 summer deep dives we're doing across the EFL between mid-June and mid-July. Already the whole League 2 um, uploaded. Plenty to come across League 1 as well over the next few weeks. And we'll see you again very soon.